Hey, deserving listeners, this is chapter 14 in our deep dive on the psychology of Elon Musk. I want to remind everyone that I'm not diagnosing from afar. That's not what I do. I am speculating based on very limited information on the internet. I could be wrong about all of this. And when I am discussing concepts, I am merely saying that if I had a client that presented this way, these are the sorts of hypotheses that I would pursue if I was asked to perform an assessment to guide treatment. So, uh, you know, it, it's all just speculative. And, you know, I, I feel comfortable doing that for educational purposes and for purposes so that we can all think about things for ourselves, particularly in this episode. But let's get to it. My name is Dr. Kirk Hanna. I'm a therapist and a professor, and this is the Psychology in Seattle YouTube channel and podcast. Who are you, Bruno? My name is Umberto Castaneda, and I return unburied truffles back to the wild. Ah, so this is a technical episode, and the concepts that I'm going to present first here, I'm just going to present them so that we get a foundation before moving on to Elon. And I use these concepts every day of my life. I use them with my clients. I use them with analyzing my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I use them with analyzing myself, analyzing you. Sure. And... I'm not using them as a weapon. I use them as a way to help me understand, but also to provoke compassion for others and myself. When I understand and I have a model for conceptualizing people's behavior, odd behavior, behavior that bothers me about others, behavior that bothers others about me, behavior that bothers me about me, <laughs> then it usually will provide an avenue towards compassion. It doesn't justify it, but other than just saying you're a bad person or you're a psychopath or you just chose to be a jerk face to people, these things make much more sense. And I also am going to suggest that if you want to, as a listener, as a viewer, you can think about this in your own life as I present these concepts. You can maybe pause it after I ask this question, but the question that I want you to think about, if you care to, is if I asked your partner or another person that you're close to, how would they answer the following questions? And the following questions are all kind of getting at one thing. But so the questions would be, what bothers these other people the most about you? You know, what, what would you think that would be? If they could change one thing about you regarding your personality or your tendencies or your, your behavior, the way that you interact or the way that you interpret things, what would that be? When in conflict with you, what do they tend to complain about you, you know, in terms of your interpretation, behavior, perceptions, patterns? So if you need to pause the pod, do so now, jot some things down. Maybe it's one thing, maybe it's a lot of things. Maybe if you don't have an answer to this question, my goodness, ask them. <laughs> because if you don't know, then you can't work on it and there's no chance that there isn't an answer to that question, even if it's a minor problem. I'm guessing it's not a minor problem, though, because we all have our problems. So this is all within the theory of psychodynamic theory or psychoanalytic theory. This theory, to me, is the only theory that explains weird, odd, bothersome behavior in ourselves and other people. And it's a bit of a dying art, which worries me, honestly. So the first concept I want to talk about is displacement introduced by Sigmund Freud about 120 years ago and further exploited and popularized by his daughter, Anna Freud, and many others. The definition is that it's an unconscious defense, meaning something that we engage in to defend ourselves against internal turmoil or conflicts within us. And it's unconscious, meaning that it happens automatically. Sometimes we can become aware of it through therapy and, and awareness, but generally speaking, it happens automatically. It, and it's a defense in which we shift feelings from the original object to another object. And object, can the word object can be a little confusing. People tend to wonder, are you talking about like like a thing, like a, mm -hmm. like a yeah. vase or something. But object just means it can be a thing like a vase, but it can also be a person. It's just the object, the target of our energies in terms of our attachments and our needs being met, you know, but you can have feelings towards a thing or a concept. Like if you were abused by 
your parents and you displaced those feelings of hurt and anger onto something else, it could be like a painting that you're painting. You know, you could be displacing your rage against your parents to a painting and you're, you know, or, or the, or a painting itself. You just rip it apart. You know, there's various different ways. The classic example of displacement is you're at work and your boss yells at you and you feel anger at your boss, but you suppress the anger for fear of being fired. So you have this inner pressure, a psychodynamic. That's what that word means is there's a dynamism, there's a dynamic, there are forces within one that are working against each other, right? Yeah, it makes so you, sense. you have the force of, I'm angry and I'm hurt and I wanna say something. You have another force of like, you, you can't say anything, you're gonna get fired. Uh, and there can be other forces like shame or you're not worth it or whatever. So you feel anger at your boss, there's a internal dynamic. You go home and you perceive that your partner is being unfair to you somehow, and you get angry at them. You express anger at them. So displacement isn't conscious. The person isn't doing it consciously, and it affects your, your perceptions as well. You ask this person, why are you getting angry at your partner? They'd be like, well, my partner was a total jerk face with X, Y, and Z. But from the outside and from the inside, you're like, mm, no, those things didn't happen. And when you look into it, they are distorting to help facilitate the ego process of the unconscious defense of, of displacement. You have to trick yourself into seeing something so that you can effectively displace something. You can't just get angry at your partner for no reason, right? So your brain will perceive things in a way to help you get rid of that anger and, and express that anger. I, I, sorry, I remember when I was in high school, I would get into these arguments with my mom that were very intense. And and I started getting really confused sometimes because she would have like a combination of disproportionate anger and almost fear during these arguments until I finally started thinking, oh, wait a minute. I think I'm starting to look more and more like my dad because I was growing up, I was getting to be older. Maybe she's project or you know, whatever, you know. Displacing. Displacing. Right, Sorry. I should say that, that a lot of people use the word project. Yeah. Just like you did. Yeah. Even clinicians. Even though we were just talking about displacing. <laughs> right. Yeah. And fine, but it's not technically, projection is a whole other thing that I'm not. So I, I, I feel like I, I, I pieced it later. I was like, oh, I think that might be what's going on here. No, I didn't know the terms. I just like, I think she thinks I'm my dad. That's the way I would put it. <laughs> right. It's kind of intuitive. Yeah. Right. And that's why Sigmund Freud first came upon this 120 years ago or longer as he was helping his patients and maybe thinking about his own life. So that leads to the next concept, which is distortion. And this is not as often talked about in psychoanalytic theory, but it's extremely important. And I find that this is often left out of analyses or it's assumed or something, but distortion is an unconscious defense in which we alter perceptions or memories to avoid emotional pain or conflict. So all defenses are in the effort of avoiding internal emotional pain or conflict. But the way that this works is that we will alter our perceptions or our memories or our feelings or our cognitions or something so that it can facilitate some other defense often. You could say denial is also in this category. So with displacement, one will also need distortion at times in order for mm. it to work. Now, you could also use displacement without distortion, like you are driving home and some asshole cuts you off on the freeway and flips you off. Well, they are being a jerk face. You just, instead of being a two out of 10 anger, yeah. you're an eight out of 10 on the anger. And that's distortion. No, that's not, that's no distortion. That's no distortion. Well, I mean, okay. I guess you could say it's distortion. Oh, distor I see, because you haven't changed what happened. You're just, right. your feeling about it is exaggerated. It, it, yeah. yeah, it's intensifying. Yeah. The, you know, the previous example with your partner, yeah. the individual is literally just making something up mm -mm. And, where it doesn't exist. So... I guess you could say that the display, well, with displacement, there's always amplification. Yeah. Anyway, so the next defense I want to talk about is projective identification. For those of you who have been listening to the podcast, you know that I've been yammering about project, and especially if you're one of my students or trainees, you know that I talk about projective identification all the time. Introduced by Melanie Klein about 100 years ago, in a nutshell, it's when a person projects unwanted feelings, thoughts, or parts of themselves onto another person, but unlike a simple projection, which maybe I should give an example of. So let's say that I am often late to things, and I don't like that about myself, and so I 
have an internal dynamic. On one hand, I'm being late to things and I'm, I'm seeing that. On the other hand, it is harmful to my self-esteem. I don't like to see that in myself. And so there's this, there's these forces that are like, no, no, I'm not. Yes, you, yeah, you are. And no, it's, it's because of the other. Okay, so you have this intro. And it's a trait. It's a tendency. And I don't like it about myself. So when someone is like a minute late to something, I'm like, oh, that person is just always oh, really? late all the time. It's just so annoying and and you know into a and a third person might be like i think you're projecting you're you're the, you're the late person you know what i mean or another right. classic example is you're cheating and this you know people hear about this that uh you'll have a partner that is accusing you of cheating all the time or flirting or heading towards cheating and you're like but i'm not yeah and then later you find out that they were the one cheating mm -hmm. it's another example you know they have an internal conflict of you're cheating and another part that's like, but bad people cheat. I'm not a cheater. And so there's a conflict there. Right. And so you need to do something with that. Well, one of the mechanisms, one of the, one of the defenses against this is to say other people are cheating and you just look for any possible excuse to distort the other person to provide projection. But with projective identification, they take it further. It makes it more sure and more easily facilitated if I actually socialize others, manipulate others, or do things that encourage others unconsciously to agree with the projection. So if with, you know, the late example, if I were to set the time at four, but then at the very last minute, I send an email out two minutes before 3.30. I'm just like, actually, we're changing it to 3.30. And then okay. someone doesn't get the email because they're right. driving over. They get and they arrive at four. And I'm just like, oh, you're late. So technically, yeah. But we understand <laughs> that that's not That's fair. so egregious. <laughs> right. But we do this all the time. More common examples in my office are projective identifications going both ways between partners. So if we internalize like a critical other from our parents, we become critical, but we don't like that about ourselves. So, you know, we need to do something with this. So we not only, you know, project it, but we find someone, we sniff someone out on when we're tindering or you know, whatever, we find someone that seems like they might have a critical streak because mm -hmm. that facilitates more easily projecting. And then I would socialize or manipulate the other person to become critical of me. Maybe I start doing things that will likely incur some kind of criticism. And then I say, oh, you're so critical. Now, meanwhile, I'm being critical and I'm the one that orchestrated the whole thing. Now, the other person is coming to the table with their own projective identifications, probably related to criticism as well. That's how these things fit together. And, and by the way, I should, these people aren't necessarily doing this consciously. Like it's just happening. Zero consciousness. Yeah, yeah. Zero. <laughs> yeah. There's no. They're not planning this. <laughs> they don't even know that they have right. internalized a critical other. You know, they, they don't. It's like there's zero. Most people have zero awareness of it. But when you become aware of it, it makes it easier to to control. It's still hard to sift through because it literally distorts perceptions and amplifies things and they it feels like something happened when it didn't or you emphasize certain memories and exclude other people do this all the time people come into my office couples and they'll talk about a fight they had on, on the car drive over uh -huh. and they will have two completely different stories and i've seen this enough times to know that they're not lying they're not spinning they literally if you hooked them up to a lie detector test they have two opposite stories that are absolutely true to them our brains are, they do a lot of things to help us get through the day, and sometimes it shoots us in the foot. So example of this is your mother critices, criticizes you throughout your childhood. Projective, the, the main projective identifications that we have tend to be chronic experiences when we're growing up because they become bolstered. But let's say you have a mother that criticizes you throughout your childhood, says, you know, you're lazy or you're fat or something, or you're not smart, and you internalize that critical other along with all the critical voices and you start to criticize yourself heavily and you start either internally or externally criticizing other people but you're not aware of it you feel justified when you're doing it but you're probably not you grow up and again you seek out other critical people you socialize them to criticize you maybe by criticizing them and then you get angry at them for criticizing you and you see yourself as a victim because the only reason why I'm being critical, oh sure, I'm being critical, but I mean, look, look, of course I'm being critical, but 
you are the one that orchestrated everything. And then, of course, from the outside, and particularly if you're the other person, you're just like, one, how did we get here? <laughs> because I didn't intend yeah. on having this fight with this person. And two, they're the one that's being critical of me. You know, and it, you know, it gets confusing. But, but this is how these things work out. All right. So let's take a break. We get back. Let's talk about corrective experiences. What do you say? Let's do it. All right. Back from the break. So the next concept I want to talk about are corrective experiences or corrective emotional experiences. Introduced, this concept was introduced by Franz Alexander and Thomas French in 1946. In a nutshell, the definition is that in order to recover from a difficult experience like a trauma, we need to have an experience that contradicts or corrects for the original trauma. So let's say, again, your mother criticizes you throughout your childhood. You internalize these critical voices. In terms of the loose definition of what a trauma trauma is, you could consider this a relational trauma. And you both criticize yourself heavily and you criticize other people heavily as well. But you're not really aware of that connection. You grow up, you enter therapy, with, let's just say it's with me, and I detect over time this subconscious urge, this unconscious urge to criticize my client. This is what we call counter-transference. So I might even be acting on it at times, but at least internally, I find myself thinking, well, that's not the right way to think, or that probably wasn't a... And there's a negative bite to it in terms of because it's, it's one thing for me to think like, huh, that's interesting. It's another thing for me to feel critical of a client. And so if I'm differentiated enough and spending the time to be aware of my countertransference, then I am given a chance to notice this. In this moment, the client is trying to get me to conform to their internalized critical mother object. Does that make sense? Is this all making sense? Yep. So that they are able to recreate the relationship with their mother. They're trying to get me to conform right. with their internalized mother object and, and it's the perception of their mother, not the reality of their mother. And so they're trying, they're subtly trying, unconsciously trying to socialize me to start criticizing me. Rick, by the way, Rick and Morty has a wonderful episode like this with where they, uh, Jerry, uh, they, they go to a couple's therapy and they produce the idealized versions of each other. And one of them is this alien decapitating monster. And the other one's this little sniveling weasel. <laughs> and those are the extreme versions, but things go awry quickly. Okay. Yeah. So the client is subconsciously trying to get me to conform with that by provoking me to criticize them. And it can be weird. It can be real subtle. They're trying to recreate their relationship with their mom so that they can purge themselves of the trait of being critical. They don't want to hold on or identify with the critical trait. It's it's very distressful. I mean, talk about one of the worst things that you could think about yourself is the primary complaint you had about your parent. You are now that. Oh, yeah. That's just the worst, right? Because you know how it feels to be at the receiving end of that. And right. to think that you are, no, there's no way I'm there. No, of, of all the things, I know what it's like to go through that. Never in a million years would I be like that. I know how that feels. And yet this is how personality is. We internalize that. We mimic it. It becomes the basis of our understanding of attachment. It's, it's, it's hard to let go of. Totally. And so we can't cope with that. And so we recreate it to get rid of that aspect and look at it outside of ourselves and we attack it in the other person, but really we're attacking it within ourselves and really we're attacking it from the original object of our trauma. So uh, in this moment, I will take the time to analyze my countertransference and differentiate myself from the urge. I work hard to resist the urge to criticize and I have to take note of certain subtle criticisms that I might be holding inside. And instead, I start to conceptualize the client a different way. I might notice, oh, okay, this must be, even though they haven't told me that their mother was critical, there, there must have been a, a very critical person in their early childhood because I don't normally have this kind of critical thoughts about clients. And then I will identify and really try to hold on to the other kinds of thoughts and feelings about my clients, things that are non-critical and are more charitable or compassionate. And if I hold on to that feeling and really, uh, you know, I don't, the, the point is, is I can't just act like I'm not critical. I have to, I have to spiritually and, you know, cognitively be non-critical because People, and particularly in the intensity of a relationship, a psychodynamic therapy relationship, clients can sense things and 
you want to have it be congruent. You want to have your words and your behavior and the subtleties of your facial expressions. You want it all to be congruent. So I really have to do a lot of work to get there. With practice, it's not hard for me to do so. Some people might see evidence of that when I'm analyzing people like Elon Musk, for example. I, I It's not hard for me to get there. Uh, sorry, let, let, let me make sure I understand this. So a client comes in, they're not obviously doing this on, on per, or consciously on purpose, but they start acting in a way that actually starts making you, the therapist, want to criticize them. Yeah. Because again, that's something that their mom or someone very important to them was doing to them. But they're they're not planning. Like, I think if I act this way, this they're just doing this. Yeah. Now, the good therapist or the trained therapist will recognize that and might intuit, oh, there might be this dynamic going on. And so, of course, they're not going to start criticizing because that, that would feed into it. But you're saying you have to actually go, go beyond not criticizing to start feeling like, well, what is the positive? What is the good? And like, like almost 100, 180 degree contradict the feeling of, of, of uh, pointing the flaws. Yeah. Okay. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. Because in order for it to be a true and rapidly healing corrective experience, it has to be all encompassing. Yeah. It can't just be like the absence of criticism. It has to be something else that replaces it, which is compassion, acceptance, like being okay with someone's mistakes, you know, or being okay if someone were to be hurtful to me. You know, that's a pretty good way to provoke a therapist to be critical of a client is for the client to be critical or to be hurtful to me, you know, like, you know, I really just kind of feel like your therapy is substandard. Or <laughs> right. That's the most direct approach. Or whatever. Or subtle <laughs> yeah, yeah. things along those lines. And that might hurt my feelings. I might get defensive. I might look for ways to be like, well, you really haven't been working hard in therapy. This is all sort of bluntly describing something that would often be a lot more subtle. So not only that, but I have to actually embody the good parent, someone who looks at a kid who makes a mistake, maybe a repetitive one, maybe even a hurtful one to me, and says, you're still a good person and it's okay, and I get it, and I understand. I feel like I've just watched one of those videos where they reveal the magic tricks, because I'm, I'm looking back, thinking back to my therapy, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this was constantly going on, because I remember I would tell my stories, right? And, and again, I wasn't consciously doing this, but I was bracing myself, oh my gosh, once I tell her this, I, she's just gonna think I'm a terrible person, you know, whatever. Right, and what you're recreating, I'm guessing, you know, I don't know, you can tell me, is abandonment and rejection because that's your trauma. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense to me. But in my mind, it's of course, oh, I can't, oh, I, I can't believe I'm going to tell her this story. She's really going to hate me after this or she's going to think I'm terrible, whatever. And the hate and the rejection never came. I kept waiting. I'm like, all right, yeah. here we go. It never came. Yeah. She's so good. Yeah. I'm so grateful. <laughs> yeah. Thank God. Yeah. Because I don't know if you and I would have survived as friends without that. <laughs> yeah. with that. And, you know, thank God for my yeah. therapist yes. and my past. And again, it's way more complicated than just being nice. People often will think even therapists will interpret all of this as like, oh, okay, well, you're just nice to your clients. No, because you can actually, by being nice, recreate a trauma for a client in a different way. Mm. So. It's not just resisting being a jerk face to your client. It is subtle. You have to have a lot of awareness. You have to go through a lot of therapy. You have to have a lot of awareness yourself in the moment. Because, mm. you know, we, we don't have the luxury of sitting down after every session and processing for an hour with our therapist. We, we have to do a lot of this work in the moment because we have seven minutes in between sessions to write our notes before another client shows up. And then when we're done with our work week, we have chores to do and taking care of kids. And You can't spend another 40 hours planning the next session. <laughs> right. So it has to become automatic so that in the moment, there's a greater chance that I will notice some impulse or some feeling in my chest or in my neck or something. And I'll go, ooh, I know what this is. Not only do I notice it, but I've noticed it so many times mm. that I'm like instantly within half a second while I'm listening and retaining everything that they're saying, I go, bing, I've been here before. I know the landscape and I'll think about it as I go. And then later on, I'm, oh, there it is again. And then without having to draw my attention away from my client, I know, okay, corrective experience is when you do blah, blah, blah. Anyway. So the next concept I want to talk about is after the next break. So let's take a break. What do you say? 
Let's do it. All right, we're back from the break. So the, the last concept I want to talk about is repetition compulsion. This is a concept introduced by Sigmund Freud 120 years ago-ish. The definition is that we have an unconscious tendency to recreate relationships in, a, in an attempt to gain mastery or closure over the past. Another term might be self-sabotage. There's other kinds of words. But as an example, let's say you have a young child that is sexually abused, unfortunately. I'm not going to go into gory details, so mild trigger warning, I guess. She grows up. And she somehow sniffs out sexual predators in the world uh, unconsciously and starts a relationship with them. She gets abused or her kids get abused. She manages to get out of the relationship, fortunately, but then she starts another relationship trying to avoid that kind of abuse. Somehow this person also is a perpetrator or is abusive in a different way. And she wonders why this keeps happening. There's no other theory uh, in psychotherapy or in psychology that explains that behavior Hmm. because it's not logical. It's not cognitive. Certainly we can think about cognitions and cognitive therapy and behavioral therapy, learning theory, and it certainly explains a lot of things. But what about these other things, particularly repetitive relationship patterns that are problematic? Well, according to Sigmund Freud, we have a compulsion to repeat the past. And over the years, and my own thinking about this has developed three reasons why we do this. But Berto, I want to ask you, why are we compelled to repeat past relational traumas? Okay, so I'm thinking, first of all, just as an evolutionary trait that was advantageous over time uh, was the ability to simulate. So because by simulating in our head, we can predict the future. And if we predict the future, we can try to change our death, you know, like prevent our death. Uh, But then you could extend that to like, oh, geez, I remember yesterday or two weeks ago, whatever, I nearly got killed by the lion going down this one path. But maybe if I go down this other path, and then you start like trying things, right? And that's just with not, not even relationships, just like with your activities and things. So potentially this same kind of pathways or related pathways started getting, you know, uh, it, it used in relationships where it's, where it's like, uh, oh yeah, that again, not consciously, but like that was painful. But maybe if I try to go down that path again, mm-hmm. but turn left, maybe I'll avoid the pain. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 That's actually a great way to put it. And I've never put it that way before, but it does fit nicely with my and maybe your notion of evolutionary psychology. There's a lot of problems with evolutionary psychology, but in terms of the claims that have been made in the past, but there, you know, there's a lot of evidence that we don't just come out of the womb with a blank slate. And there are certain tendencies that in all likelihood contributed to increasing our chance of survival and procreation, like our compulsion for most people to couple, to have sex, our compulsion to have fats and And salt and sweets. (laughs) Colorful things. (laughs) Yeah. One could speculate that we evolved this survival mechanism that helps us with predators and when we go through relational traumas, it's in the same category of the brain of a threat that's happening to us. And then we are trying to simulate it again so that we can get it right this time and avoid the relational traumas. Mm. That's a different way of putting what I found for myself is that we are trying to have a corrective experience. We're trying to correct for the past. We are trying to recreate it so that we can get it right this time, but it's unconscious. And if if we're not aware of this process, then we will recreate it so well that we just have another traumatic experience. Well, it's, it's interesting because if you think about it in, in the relationship side of things, you could say, well, there's, you know, 8 billion people. So this type didn't work. Let me go find something completely different, right? You could think that way. But when you when you narrow it down back to like, you know, a million years ago or whatever, you can't not go get food, right? That's not a choice. And getting food is dangerous. So what are you going to do? Yeah. You have to find a way to get the food. Yeah, it's, it's, I never <laughs> thought about that either. Yeah, yeah right. If a uh, jaguar <laughs> ate your brother yeah. and you witnessed it and it was a traumatic experience, it's not like you can say, hmm, I think I'll just live in a world without jaguars. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you got, you got, I'll move to a different continent. Easily. Yeah, I'll go to Mars. <laughs> Take a flight. There's no, okay. um, so there are two other reasons. One is that the saying goes better the devil you know than the devil you don't, meaning that it's comfortable. It's understandable. You were saying predictable is important for us. We hate to have things be overly chaotic and unpredictable. Yeah. We like predictable things. If 
you go into a relationship where, the, you know, say you were abused and your subconscious, your unconscious is like, I'm probably not going to get abused by this person. I have no idea what that looks like. Unknown, unknown, unknown. Mm. There's a heuristic of avoid the unknown. Let's just let's just go with what we are comfortable with. At least I can predict right. with abuse. I know what that looks like. It's comfortable and will will unconsciously be attracted to it, you know. That's bizarre, but we we encounter this all day all day long in every facet, right? Like I'm a gamer, you're a gamer. How often might you read or someone says, "Oh, you know you could be using these other keys to do." Th-? And you're like, "Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm fine with my mouse. I already learned how to do my mouse." It's yeah, fine. that's a great example because <laughs> in gaming, like if we're, you know, uh, to be specific, like <laughs> Um, I don't have as much experience with real-time strategy games as you do. And so when you and I first started playing it, I had to quickly learn and we started playing StarCraft II and I was terrible at it. And I chose a strategy that was a lot more handleable based on defense and like clumps of armies instead of like, you know, five different squads going (laughs) all over the place. And over time, though, I started to learn a little bit more. It's not like I sat down for a few weeks to like develop my skills. It was just like we're playing. I, I'm learning a couple new things, and I just want to have fun. And then we play again. So in life, it's not like we just stop down for a while and say, okay, you know what? I need to develop skills right. that are like way beyond my current skill set so that I can deal with situations like this. Right. No, we just go from problem to problem to problem, and we think, well... I know that this kind of worked in the, you know, maybe it's not the best like solution. Yeah. Like when we would play Age of Empires, yeah. I was like, I know I don't have the best or playing guitar, or piano. Right. I've, I've never taken a guitar lesson or a piano <laughs> lesson. And so when I play guitar and piano, I actually know that I am not playing the guitar or piano right. <laughs> right. And yet I don't want to change it because for me to change it would mean that I would have to start from scratch, you know, and I don't have the time for that. You know, people that use keyboard, do you, do you use proper uh, keyboard? Yeah. yeah. So you were taught that. I'm yeah, guessing. I was taught that when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah me too. I took a keyboard class yeah. in early high school and I learned how to properly use a keyboard so I don't have to look at it, you know, whereas my wife, she didn't. So mm. she pecks at it. Pecks. And sure, if she sat down for a month or something and really worked at it, but who has time? So like with our relationships and getting our needs met for attachment and entertainment and interaction and stuff, then we just kind of say, well, I know I, I know it's better if I don't look at the keyboard and use all eight of my fingers, but who has the time to learn all that? I'll just go with the peck thing. It, it works. It, it's it's good enough. You yeah. know what I mean? And so, yeah, he's, he's abusive. He has those kinds of leanings, but I don't want to have to learn all... So anyway, yeah. Yeah, it's comfortable. Also, the abuse, if you go through that as a child is completely interwoven with attachment. Hmm. So it feels like attachment when abuse is happening. And when abuse isn't happening, subconsciously, there's this feeling of like, well, this this isn't attachment then. This isn't actually meeting my needs, but it is meeting their needs. Anyway, yeah. this, the, the third reason is that for some people, they want control over the bad things that are going to happen to them. So they will unconsciously get out ahead of it and just create it because they know it's going to happen anyway. So if you're going to be abused and you know people who go through chronic abuse growing up or rejection or criticism, they surrender and say, okay, there's no use fighting against it. This is going to happen. There's something about other people. There's something about me. And that's that. Mm. So what can I do about it? Well, I, I hate waiting around for it to happen. So what if I just made it happen so that I can, one, get it out of the way. Two, I can also maybe control when or how it happens to me from which person because it's going to happen eventually. So I might as well try to work with it. And also it gives it gives someone a sense of control to be relationally traumatized as an adult, randomly, you're being traumatized and you're not in control. But if you cause it, you're being relationally traumatized. But you have the benefit of saying, well, at least, mm. at least I, I have some control over the world, you know? Right. It's, and it's not really control, right? It's It feels like control, but it's not. Anyway, okay, so let's take a break. But I want to summarize. We just went over displacement, distortion, projective identification, corrective experiences, and repetition compulsion. After the break, we're going to apply all this to Elon Musk in light of what we talked about last time with not only all all of his traumas, but also the events of 2018 with the Thailand kids cave 
incident and my speculation as to what was going on there and how this in all likelihood kind of broke him in some ways. Doesn't excuse what he did, but like I said, we all do bothersome things. Yep. And I think that this theory provides an explanation. But if you want to hear that discussion, become a patron of the podcast. Otherwise, please take care of yourself because you deserve it.